I think those of you who have been in our school know that uh, it's a tradition here for me to make three points when I introduce uh, anybody. So uh, I'll make three quick points before I welcome President Lee Bollinger to the stage. He'll speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we can have a question and answer session. And the good news is that President Lee Bollinger said is that you can ask him any questions you want, either about the subject, universities, or global society, or any subject that. So start thinking of very difficult questions uh, for him. My first point uh, is, of course, about the most important person in the room. Uh, and of course, each one of you thinks you're the most important person in the room. Uh, the most important person in the room, of course, is Dr. Lee Seng Ti, because thanks to him, we have the ST Lee Distinguished Annual Lecture Series. So first of all, please join me in thanking Dr. Lee Seng Ti. I, I, want, I, I want to say uh, quite a bit about his accomplishments. Uh, he's a respected businessman, philanthropist, patron of education and the arts, and it's important to emphasize that he has made significant contributions to higher education worldwide. He's the benefactor of the Lee Seng Ti Reading Rooms at Cambridge and at Oxford Universities, the ST Lee Lounge at the University of Pennsylvania, and by the way, I can go on, but there's a long list. But I also want to mention that he has also funded a number of distinguished lecture series at academic institutions uh, throughout the world uh, in places like in Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard, spanning topics in humanities, military history, public policy, and government institutions. Um, and for his generosity and spirit of promoting education, Dr. Lee has in, earned honorary degrees and fellowships in America, Europe, Asia, and New Zealand. And these included being appointed as the Honorary Fellow of the British Academy and Foreign Honorary Member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And these are, of course, are remarkable awards uh, that Dr. Lee has won. Uh, I, I can go on, but I think the most important thing I want to emphasize about Dr. Lee uh, is how modest he is. And we discovered his modesty one night when my wife happened to be sitting next to him at dinner and she had a wonderful conversation with him and she was fascinated by Dr. Lee. Then she finally turned to Dr. Lee and said, so but Mr. Dr. Lee, what, what, what do you do? So Dr. Lee was very puzzled by my wife's question. He said, well, I sell pineapples. <laughs> so my wife had this impression he was wheeling a cart down selling pineapples. <laughs> but that's Dr. Lee, very modest. My second point uh, is about um, the collaboration between Columbia University uh, and our school. And here, of course, we are very, very proud to have this collaboration with Columbia University, which, as you know, is one of the greatest universities in America and in the world, a member of the Ivy League, and indeed founded in 1754, making it the oldest institute, institution of higher education in the state of New York. Uh, I can, again, give a long lecture about Columbia University, but let me just mention a few facts. Uh, Columbia University annually grants the Pulitzer Prizes, and more Nobel Prize winners are affiliated with the university than any other institution in the world. That's a remarkable distinction. Its notable alumni and affiliates include four United States presidents, including the current president of the United States, Barack Obama, and I can tell you that Dr. Lee, that Dr. Lee, that uh, Lee Bollinger was actually supposed to deliver this lecture in January this year. The plans were all set. He was going to come until President Barack Obama decided to visit Columbia University on exactly the same day. <laughs> and that's why we are here in October uh, to listen to um, President Lee Bollinger now. I also want to mention that uh, several schools in Columbia are ranked very highly. Uh, including our partner institution, uh, CIPA, which is ranked overall in international relations number two, uh, and its master's program is also ranked number two in the United States of America. And according to U.S. News and World Report 2010, the Undergraduate School of Columbia University is ranked second among national universities. The Graduate School of Journalism ranks number one, the School of Social Work number four, and according to the Financial Times, the Columbia Business School ranks number two. You can see that Columbia University clearly is in the top league. 
And this is why I can tell you that we were really truly delighted when the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy joined CIPA, Columbia University, the London School of Economics, and Sciences Po in Paris to uh, become members of the Global Public Policy Network. And we thank you, Lee, for including us uh, in this uh, network. And as a result of that, we have a wonderful exchange of students. Uh, we have sent under the dual degree students. We, we have received four students from CIPA, sent nine students from our school. We have had exchange students uh, also going to and fro within CIPA uh, in our school. I also want to mention that our senior management program that we run every, every year is run in collaboration with CIPA of Columbia University, and we've also had faculty exchanges uh, with Columbia University. Now for my third and final point, uh, let me talk a little bit about the speaker. Uh, Lee Bollinger has had a very long and distinguished career. After graduating from the University of Oregon and Columbia Law School, uh, Lee Bollinger served as law clerk for Judge uh, Feinberg on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for Chief Justice Warren Berger on the United States Supreme Court. And from, from 1993 to 1994 and from 1996 to 2002, uh, Mr. Lee Bollinger was at the University of Michigan starting as a law professor, eventually earning the position as dean of the law school in 1987 and president of the university in 1996. In June 2002, Lee Bollinger became the 19th president of Columbia University, and under his leadership, Columbia University has launched the largest capital campaign in its history and proposed its most ambitious campus expansion in more than a century. He has also launched a number of new initiatives that include, one, the World Leaders Forum, which invites prominent international figures to the campus to engage in major issues of the time, the Faculty Co uh, Committee on Global Thought to pursue scholarship and generate new curriculum models, as well as new academic partnerships with institutions around the globe, of course, including uh, with our school. He's also a leading scholar. He's widely published on uh, issues of freedom and speech and press. Indeed, we had a fascinating conversation in my office a few minutes ago about the history uh, of the United States in this area. Uh, he's also won numerous awards for his work in education uh, in other areas. He's received the National Humanitarian Award from the National Conference for Community and Justice, the National Equal Justice Award from N NAACP Legal Defense, and the Clark uh, Award the highest award of comfort by the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley. In short, we are truly privileged to have a truly distinguished citizen address us today. With that, I welcome you, Lee, to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kishore, for that gracious uh, introduction. And thank you for uh, the honor uh, being asked to deliver the first S.T. Lee Lecture uh, at this Distinguished School of Public Policy. Uh, I want to begin by recognizing and thanking uh, Dean Kishore Mavubani. Uh, he is a remarkable and very important voice uh, in the world today. And I also want to express my gratitude to S.T. Lee uh, for uh, establishing this lecture. His reputation extends and his influence extends far beyond uh, the borders of Singapore. He is not only one of this country's most successful businessmen, he is also one of the world's most devoted and generous supporters of education and the arts. From Harvard and Oxford to Cambridge and Columbia, he has continued his father's legacy of commitment to education and public service. And for all of this, we are very, very grateful. I would like to also recognize and introduce my wife, Jean. Among her many and extraordinary personal qualities, uh, and talent, she is also a very fine artist. And I wish, rather than listen to my dry words today, you could instead see her art. 
uh, and especially her work uh, that she's done over many years on scrolls using meditative uh, techniques uh, as a means of establishing visual forms. It is very much inspired by Asian life and aesthetics, and so it is especially good that she is here uh, with all of us today. Um, my topic today, uh, I was asked by Kishore to think about universities uh, in this global world, and uh, that is something, of course, all of us are uh, really trying to figure out. So I will use this occasion uh, to describe uh, what it is and how we're thinking about this uh, at Columbia uh, and beyond, uh, but that, that really is the uh, subject. We are very much uh, already uh, an international university and in particular uh, noted for uh, our work at Columbia in Asian studies. Uh, Columbia was the first American university to develop a broad-based study program uh, to integrate Asia uh, and Asian studies into the core curriculum at Columbia. Uh, and the influence and importance of the region uh, has woven through uh, the curriculum and the research uh, at the university. Uh, this is a, a great and long, very distinguished relationship between this part of the world uh, and Colombia. I am also very proud of the partnership uh, that we have forged with the Lee Kuan Yew uh, School of Public Policy just three years uh, into the existence of, of this great uh, school. Uh, Columbia joined uh, with the school and LSE &E and Sciences Po in Paris uh, to establish uh, the Global Public Policy Network, which all of you know about. Uh, and this, as I will say in just a bit, I think is a, a good model uh, for what universities broadly should be doing in today's world. Uh, let me say um, at the outset. Uh, that uh, on the subject I was asked to talk about today, as I've said, universities in the world, uh, I do not pretend to be uh, deeply original or profound uh, on this. All of us uh, are trying to figure this out, and all I can offer to you is my own thoughts and words uh, on this matter. Uh, I think it is of the highest importance uh, that we figure this out, uh, and uh, I have spent a great deal of time uh, myself uh, doing it. If, if I convey anything to you, uh, I hope it is uh, the sense of modesty uh, that I feel towards this great subject, and uh, I think all of us, especially in the United States, uh, should feel. To understand the role that universities need to assume in the new world of globalization, you need first to understand two things. First, the phenomena of globalization itself. What are its underlying causes? What is happening because of it? And what needs to be done to channel and complement its energies in order at the end of the day to make the world a better place. Second, you need to have a deep grasp of universities, specifically what their purposes and capacities are, particularly as they relate to the phenomena of globalization, and what must be done to help them play a helpful and positive role. Only with a nuanced understanding of both globalization and universities, in my view, can you then design specific plans and programs for our universities to follow in the future. So let me turn to these two subjects. First, globalization. The most important fact about globalization is that it is primarily being driven by the extraordinary international consensus that free markets, capitalism, 
is the best system for organizing economic activity. Even though this consensus has emerged only within the last few decades, it has already assumed the status of a working norm and provided a stable foundation for the international community. Globalization is fundamentally, then, about trade in goods and services and business investment. Today, some 40 percent of the earnings of the S&P 500 companies derive or come from foreign sources, 40 percent. In today's world, international trade and investment constitutes a significant portion of the economies of the developed uh, world and dominate the economies in the developing world. The upshot is a world economic system that makes everyone, small and large, developing and developed, more and more integrated into a whole and interdependent on everyone else. In the most recent recession, so I was told at the uh, recent uh, meeting of the New York uh, Federal Reserve Bank, which uh, may be wrong at this point, but this is what I was told, in the most recent recession, the GDP of Singapore, as you know, one of the best-run economies in the world, fell 20 percent, painfully proving the interdependency of our world. It is true, of course, that other forces are contributing to the increasing interconnectedness of world societies, new technologies of communication, primarily the Internet and satellites, the ease of travel, the increase of common languages. These and other factors contribute to what we think of as globalization. But the simple fact is that globalization is first and foremost an economically driven phenomenon. It is producing many benefits, most notably the rise in living standards and the general well-being of hundreds of millions of people. It is also producing problems, tensions between those who do not like the conditions of modernity, tensions arising from the very uneven distribution of wealth being created, and environmental issues of such a magnitude as to threaten the very survival of the planet as we know it. One thing we do know for sure is that we do not have a place in the systems, we do not have in place the systems of governance or the institutions to guide globalization into a benign world society, global society. What we do have is a system more or less designed to deal with the post-World War II Cold War era, patched together here and there as time and circumstances have evolved. But our collective global institutions lag far behind the racing forces of economic and technological integration. This gap between the international mechanisms and processes of governance and the forces of globalization, which, as I said, are economic, is just one important observation that flows from seeing globalization not as some natural total integration of the peoples of the world into a single whole, but rather as a partial and in some ways distorted integration. Markets are very good systems for creating material well-being and meeting some human needs and aspirations, but markets cannot and should not dominate or even drive our quest for the ends of life. Markets do, however, move with startling speed, and unless we're careful and thoughtful, we will not end up where we want. Uh, to be. We need to look at all this and ask the question, given the course we're on, how do we create the conditions for moving towards a global society, not just a world business society? This brings us to what I believe is the heart of the matter at hand, namely the world is racing ahead by virtue of economic activity and we simply do not have the information or the knowledge 
that is adequate to this absolutely vital task of figuring out how to shape, channel, control, direct, or supplement these forces. Nor do we have anything close to the intellectual resources devoted to producing that information and knowledge. It is a mistake, moreover, to believe that a laissez-faire system of free markets will itself naturally or otherwise produce or yield the information that is needed, just like it is a myth to assume that the Internet itself will end censorship. Like any human system, economic activity generates pressure for some openness, but it also seeks secrecy and opaqueness for other information. So we, we must actively find other ways to get the knowledge we need and the information we need to deal with this emerging global society. Gathering and disseminating information and knowledge is the basic mission of two major social institutions, organizations dedicated to providing independent, objective gathering of facts and analysis. And we have two such institutions. The press is one, and universities are another. I will soon publish a book with Oxford University Press that explores how a free and independent press can be created uh, in, uh, to serve the needs of a global society. One of the distressing facts about the business of journalism today is that the Internet has both expanded the audiences for the press and undermined the financial model of the press, leading to a frightening retraction in journalism about international affairs, thereby reinforcing a very bad tendency in American society of always looking inwardly and provincially. But my subject here today is universities, and they are every bit as important to the development of knowledge and analysis needed for directing globalization on a positive course as any other institution. So here we encounter several problems. Universities, by nature, adjust slowly. When events in the outside world change rapidly, as is occurring now, it takes time for research agendas and curricula to shift accordingly. Moreover, there is always an uneasy relationship between the subjects of scholarly activity and teaching and events beyond the academy. The logic of the pursuit of knowledge includes but is not determined by issues in the world at large. Over time, we find great variation in the degree to which disciplines and fields are directly concerned with trying to solve problems of immediate interest to the society. Some parts of the academy are more applied than others, engineering versus mathematics, for example, but even within that variation, the degree of engagement with real issues can change. The important fact here is that universities, at least those in the United States, are seriously challenged in being able to respond to the issues posed by globalization. Aside from the problem of it just takes time to adjust, and aside from the fact that economic globalization has occurred with extraordinary rapidity, there are two factors that make this adjustment in universities more, even more difficult. The first is that over the past quarter century, many disciplines and professional schools have followed academic agendas that have been and are, in general, less engaged with understanding actual and immediate problems around the world. This is a very complicated matter, but perhaps it is most visible in the decline of interest in particular fields, especially the social sciences and some areas like law, in particular knowledge about particular regions uh, of the world. It is also a problem for universities uh, that we are devoted to specialization. And again, this is an immensely complicated matter, but the basic point is that academic energies tend to focus or build upon prior work, which leads younger scholars uh, searching for ever narrower lines of inquiry in which they can make a contribution 
rather than striking out in search of new subjects where our collective knowledge may be very superficial or non-existent. The stunning fact about globalization is that the problems posed are very often quite new to us. And most of us do not have the life experiences, and I mean experiences as simple as living abroad or knowing other languages, to draw upon to build our new knowledge. We need explorers as much as we need scholarly experts in this new environment. And universities tend not to favor explorers. Americans know shockingly little about China, for example, including those even in our universities. And we have perhaps only two dozen foreign correspondents in the press or journalists in China trying to help the entire United States know more about this vast country. This brings me to the question, how to think about universities in this modern era of globalization then. I think there presently are four general strategies being followed, the last two of which I think are promising and consistent with what we really need. The first strategy is just to do more of what we have been doing in American or in universities. In many ways, U US universities are already very international. Most faculty members, departments, schools, and institutions have connections and partnerships around the world. Since uh, the 1950s, we have built up strong centers of research and teaching in different regions of the world, and there are joint research projects, alliances between universities, student exchanges, study abroad programs. These and other practices define the modern university. So the first idea that occurs to people is just do more of these things. The problems with this approach are several. Most importantly, the need we have is both for expert and general knowledge about how to build upon the forces of globalization towards the creation of a more integrated global society. The expertise we have is not enough. It is too fragmented for a world that's more interconnected than ever before. Moreover, moreover our work is too US-centric. And our general knowledge, that is what people generally know about the world, is far too thin. Therefore, doing more of what we're already doing is just not going to be enough. A second strategy is to establish branch campuses around the world with more or less separate faculty and students. Uh, we, see, we are seeing a fair amount of this with US universities, especially with projects in the Emirates. This kind of global footprint is thought to yield significant benefits from direct engagement with the world in ways that can come from having a physical presence. But there are substantial limits to this strategy, and the most important is finances. It is a simple fact of life that universities are money-losing operations. Tuition never covers the cost of running a university, and consequently, it is not a surprise that the one place most of the branch campus activity is, take, is where it's taking place is in the very wealthy Emirates. Um, another problem is that many universities are finding it difficult to get their own faculty to travel and teach in these branch campuses, which means they cannot deal with one of the primary problems we have, which is a lack of knowledge about the world. And finally, there is one other limitation, which is that when U.S. faculty go abroad in this way, we are generally operating within our own areas of expertise. And expertise has a tendency to depress our natural openness and, and curiosity about new experiences, which is exactly what we need today. Not our expertise to be spread around the world, but our openness to the new world as it is. It is for all these reasons that we are trying a different approach. And the first approach, a third of those that we're using, and the one that I, of two that I think is most promising, is to develop deep networks and alliances 
with other schools and universities around the world. While these sometimes uh, tend to be weak and dependent on the interests of just a few faculty who form them, if we do what is now being done with this school and with several others, including Columbia, that is establishing joint degrees, joint faculty, and shared courses, we have a chance of opening up our knowledge base to the world as it is. We've entered into several of these, and this one is one of the most prominent. We should do more of this for across the university as a whole, not just in schools of public policy. The fourth and last strategy, then the one that I think is also promising, is to establish what we're calling research centers in different places around the world, and then to link these up technologically and otherwise. We call these global centers and conceive of them as part of a network of mutually reinforcing activities. Last March, we established the first of these in Beijing and in Amman, Jordan, and this coming spring, we hope to do so in Paris and Mumbai with ones in Africa and South America to follow. The basic idea behind the global centers is to put together interdisciplinary teams of faculty and students to do research work through the centers in partnership with local institutions on major local and regional problems needing academic attention, and then linking this work on these projects throughout the system to courses and research activities back to the main campus in New York City. The hope is that this will bring our expertise to world issues, help us develop new expertise, reshaping expertise in the process, but even more importantly, introducing us firsthand to the world and thereby to give opportunities for people to develop entirely new forms of expertise. We have to realize that in this new environment of globalization, we do not yet even know the questions to be asked, the issues to explore, the data to be gathered and analyzed. And we first have to put in place the framework in which we can educate ourselves, sometimes at even the most basic levels. Thus far, the experience of the centers has been tremendous. There seems to be an enormous pent-up demand among faculty and students for ways to learn about the world. My view is that the best way for this to happen is by using the thing that comes most natural to people, which is their desire to do research. This is just one of several new initiatives we have in our limited way to deal with the problem of globalization and the lack of knowledge. We have established a committee on global thought led by Joe Stiglitz with the purpose of bringing together people of different backgrounds to think about new agendas for what the world needs. As Kishore said, the World Leaders Forum brings leaders to campus and then links them up with classes uh, that are going on uh, and give students the opportunities to interact with uh, people of significant power around the world. And our in Earth Institute has become a leading voice for issues like sustainable development, climate change, and extreme dealing with extreme poverty. We still have a long ways to go, but these are the routes we think are most congruent with the issues of our time. The current state of universities and the collective ambition we have for a role our great institutions can play in shaping a better world. The central meaning of all we do must now be to become learners again and not let being learned to get in the way. That is our challenge and this is the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. Yes, indeed. Uh, I was going to say that the topic for your lecture was very appropriate today because I should have explained earlier that the way this lecture series began was a result of a meeting 
uh, when my colleague and I, Dr. Anne Florini and I, called on Dr. Lee Singti in his office, and we said, Dr. Lee, we have a project to save the world. And uh, we literally did. We, we, we launched a, a SP lead project on global governance. And in that project on global governance, we're discussing various global challenges that we face. And some of them actually were covered in your lecture. So we will add your lecture great. to the SD lead project to save the world also. Great. Love to save the world. <laughs> that would be great. Um, so I, I must say that, that you, 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 you covered a lot of ground. And, and your, you, you did make a point that, you know, when you look at all the uh, branch campuses, they're happening predominantly in the wealthy countries. Right. When, in fact, the need, as you know, right. is in the less wealthy countries. Right. So how – let me ask the first question before I throw the floor open. How do we, in a sense, deliver first-class higher education in the areas of greatest need? I mean, let's take Africa, for example. How do we, in a sense, deliver high-quality education there? What would your answer be there to that question? Well, I think um – uh, I mean, as you know, I mean, the, the primary focus of, of what I was trying to talk about today was how to get American universities mm. to become more open mm. uh, about um, uh, what the world is becoming mm. so that we can have the kind of critique mm. that I think is needed for what I identify as the, the force of globalization, mm. which is economic activity. I, I, I just think that we cannot let the world sort of just spin forward mm -hmm. with, this, uh, w with this system without universities playing their historic role of providing critiques of how mm -hmm. the world is developing. If you turn to the subject of, of how do you provide education, mm -hmm. my own sense is that that will grow. If, if we did this successfully, if, if American universities in particular, just focus on those, really were out there in the world doing work on new subjects, I think, and forging relationships with local institutions, those would be local universities in all likelihood, that will really help, I think, to uh, improve educational opportunities every place we go. Any one institution is like Columbia is just going to be a, a drop in the bucket. Mm. But all the universities together, if they followed this, they were really out there with faculty and students. That could be that could have a big impact, I think. Mm -hmm. Great questions, please, Anne, and then lady over there. Go ahead. And as I, remi I must remind you, he's prepared to answer questions on any subject. Okay, so. Don't confine your questions to your yeah, Exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, I think this is a, a fairly broad-ranging question. Um, in keeping with Kishore's request that we ask provocative questions, um, <laughs> a liberal arts education in the American sense is a profoundly threatening kind of education in many ways. The purpose of it is to educate people not only to have expertise in certain areas, but to think in ways that are not always very comfortable for the societies in which these institutions exist. How, in your efforts to globalize the American University, to globalize Columbia, do you deal with the nature of the political systems and the economic systems in some of the places in which you are trying to expand? And given your own work on press freedom and related kinds of issues, do you see it as part of the mission of a globalizing American University to spread a particular set of values? or to engage in a conversation? Right. Um, so I, I think that's really a profound problem. And um, as you say, I, I think we, speaking we as American universities, but I, I think also reflected in American society, if you think about free speech, free press, which happens to be my, uh, my area, there is a very, very strong commitment to living in a world in which there is widespread potential for widespread disagreement, including opinions that are very offensive uh, or more or less offensive uh, to people or people regard as dangerous and, and the like. 
that is a that is a core that has become a core principle, um, and it goes along with the idea of independent thinking and and so on. Another facet of it, I think, which is not often identified, is a belief that young people are expected to be creative. That is, one way to approach life is to say, young people have a lot to learn. They really shouldn't strike out to be creative until after they've had a long tutelage and apprenticeship under senior people who are much more knowledgeable and experienced. Our basic system is built upon the idea that if you're 25, 30 years old and, and you're a, a, a student or a new faculty member, your job is actually to say something new and different from what has been said before. That has some bad consequences, one of which is you, you get a lot of dumb ideas. Um, but it has this wonderful effect uh, of, of bringing a constantly challenging kind of environment. Now, when you go abroad, a lot of the world just doesn't organize itself that way. And it views that as as being very uh, uh, potentially dangerous and, and counterproductive and, and so on. I think our, my attitude about this, I'll just speak on, on my own behalf, my attitude is that the world does need to be helped more towards that kind of, of value system. But we need to remember that it took the United States 200 years to actually develop it, and it's still constantly threatened, constantly in jeopardy. Um, and, and you can go back, uh, when I teach my First Amendment course, the, the, the 20th century is filled with examples, of horrendous examples of censorship and repression, and not living up to, to that standard. Universities themselves are uh, filled with examples of not living up to that, that standard. So the United States has struggled with it. We've struggled with it. I do believe in it. I think it's the most vital, most exciting, most exhilarating, most productive kind of world to have. Uh, and we should be out there trying to, to deal with the world, hoping that, that we can help to, to bring that about there too. The counter to that, of course, is that it's just an American set of values that you know, we would be imposing on the world. And that's just another example of American insensitivity uh, to global differences. My own view is you have to start someplace uh, with some kind of values. And, and that's, I think, a core value. Great. I saw another hand up there. Please go ahead. Can you come to the mic? Identify yourself. You that was Dr. Antroni earlier. Uh, good evening, President Bollinger. My name is Anu Singh, and I'm a first-year student, master's in public policy here. I also have the misfortune of being a lawyer. Um, <laughs> first, may I say, I wish my husband were here to take notes on the encomium to your wife. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a question. When you speak of your outreach that university should do to the four corners of the world, and you also spoke of the quote-unquote shocking ignorance of many young Americans. Wouldn't it also be worthwhile for August universities such as Columbia to mm -hmm. conduct similar outreach to what I would call the genesis of that ignorance, which is your schools, your primary schools, your high schools? Because the students who come to your universities are by, ne are by necessity the best of, and the brightest. Mm -hmm. but to really have a sweeping change, shouldn't universities also be reaching out to the students who don't, to students at a level where they would be most influenced? Right. So, uh, so the point is uh, that the American system of, of public education, K through 12, is in uh, dire straits, and as great as American universities may be. Uh, if K through 12 is as poorly put together as it is, it's just going to have a very difficult time achieving this kind of uh, uh, greater openness to globalization. And, and I think that's right. The question is, what can universities do about it? 
And I think almost all American uh, U.S. universities, certainly the ones that I know of, have struggled with this. On the one hand, you say, what do we really know of, about K through 12 education? Actually, we're, we're very good at university education, but maybe not at K through 12. I think most people say that that's not acceptable. We, we do have to do something. So, so for example, we have agreed with the city of New York to set up a public um, high school on our new campus in Harlem uh, that will have a special focus on science, engineering, and math, and 40% of the children will come from Harlem, and they will be given special tutoring from uh, the sixth grade on to prepare them for this. It's a very concrete thing that, uh, that we're doing. We also have a K through eight school where 50% of the children come from the community chosen on the basis of lottery. And then there are just dozens and dozens of ways in which schools, departments, and faculty interact with the local schools. If you magnify all that across the country, it's a pretty significant uh, uh, operation. I think the problems, however, can, and then there's affirmative action, which is a way in American universities of trying to get a diverse student body, uh, but frankly also to try to address the fact that in the United States, uh, in many, there is still so much segregation uh, in the country based on race uh, that universities need to, to work on that uh, to have more diverse student bodies. Uh, some cities, metropolitan areas, are as segregated or more segregated than they were in 1960, uh, which is when the period of, of really active civil rights uh, issues or, or efforts begin. So this is an, an unfortunate, deeply unfortunate, very, very significant problem in American society. So there, we work on it in that way, but it actually cannot be solved uh, by American universities. One of the biggest problems, I think, for K through 12 uh, is the fact that it is funded by property taxes, uh, which means that your fate uh, as a child will depend significantly upon the wealth of the community in which you happen to be born. Uh, and, and that's obviously uh, not a, a, good, uh, a good situation. But that's the way it is in the United States. That has to change. And then teachers, the, the education of teachers and also the, the pay of teachers. Uh, and my own view is that some of the um, uh, protections uh, that, that are given to teachers through union negotiations also have to be broken down. All these are commonly debated, as you know in the United States, but, but it's a very significant problem beyond the reach of universities. Over there, and then gentlemen over there, please, <coughs> your next subject. Thank you, President Ali. My, uh, my name is Sunshine. I'm from China. I'm PP Senior Lee Kuan School. My question is that uh, what's your opinion about the, the relationship between universities? In theory, it seems I'm that- I'm sorry, the relationship between? Universities. Different universities. Yeah. There should be cooperators or competitors. In theory, it seems that the universities should share their resources to develop the world. But in reality, most of the universities do care the rank around the universities. Universities do compete for best students and best professors. So I want to know your opinion. Thank you. Should universities cooperate or compete more? Yeah, right. Um, well, I, I, obviously we have to do, we do both. Competition is part of what, uh, what makes, um, I, I think, makes us all sharp and, and really try to do better and, and uh, cooperation because actually as institutions we are, we are not trying to make a profit. Uh, we're not trying to, to make money. We're trying to do good for the world uh, in the ways that, that we, um, we define it. Uh, and therefore, cooperation is part of more the essence of, of what it is that, that we should be doing. I think, uh, I mean, my, my point, um, one of the key points of this talk is to, is to recognize, to start from a premise that 
we are simply in an era, uh, we have to recognize we're in an era where the, the world is being transformed in the space of a very short period of time. I mean, just incredibly rapidly uh, by the activity of markets. And we in universities are not up to the task of dealing with that new world in the ways we're supposed to, to do research on it, to think about it, reflect on it, understand the forces, try to offer ideas for shaping it, creating institutions in the world that can, can grapple with it. We are moving, should be moving towards a global society, and universities should be helping to, to guide that path, and we don't have the expertise or the general knowledge, as I call it, to perform that task. And that's a, just a, a, an oversimplified version of what it is. Uh, I think we're behind for good reasons and bad reasons, and we need to try to catch up. Collaborations that, like this one that we have are terrific uh, in doing that. Um, we, we have to do more, however, and we have to, I think, jointly undertake major research projects on what it is. We have to pool our resources, uh, and we have to undertake major research projects on, on what's happening uh, in the world and how to think about it. I mean, one of the things I find striking is that the, the press regards it as natural that it would have journalists out in the world in foreign bureaus, in Afghanistan, in wars, trying to understand what's happening. Why don't we put together teams of faculty and students who are also in Afghanistan, let's just take that one place, or in Iraq, or in other places, also trying to figure out what is happening and what needs to have the attentions of research. Um, we're leaving this far too much to the natural kinds of, of uh, courses that, act, that our very atomistic institutions will take, and, and that's really not going to do the job. But, but, but as you know, the incentive system, uh, they, all the faculty members are searching for tenure and not searching it's, for. It's, <laughs> and, and it's, everybody is so autonomous and they do what they want to do and, um, and people like you and me have no power. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I know. Give, it's, give it's a, and presidents more power. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the point of the, uh, of the talk. <laughs> I saw a hand over there back there and then the lady is, yeah, please. Um, uh, LLM from uh, Columbia 93. Um, I teach here at the law faculty. Um, may I follow up on your, uh, question, your answer to the question on uh, freedom of expression, uh, yeah. freedom of speech? And I like your answer, uh, but it was an answer that was in the world context, and yeah. how the universities, uh, the American universities, could go in the world context. Can I ask you what, in your view, is important in freedom of expression for the benefit of the university itself. What kind of freedom to discuss, to research, a university should have in order to be a good university? To which extent um, not having this atmosphere of exchange and disagreement or the ability to have this kind of debates publicly can hinder uh, the ability of being a good university, of attracting people, and of having partnerships around the world that would be significant. So uh, let me make sure that I, I, I answer uh, your question. And if I don't, please just stay right there and, and just say that uh, the question was different. I worry, um, I worry about two things. I, I worry that the principle of widespread, very robust debate, uh, the principle will be uh, not recognized or sacrificed. And so I also worried, worry that when, even when you have the principle, it won't be practiced uh, and that people will fall into a, a kind of environment in which people just don't want to, to disagree. 
my own view is that uh, saying what you believe and then listening and doing it in the right kinds of ways um, is really essential to the vitality of the principle itself. So uh, I'm a strong believer that universities should uh, resist outside criticism uh, for taking on issues that are supposed to be beyond their uh, capacity or not appropriate for them or, uh, I mean, we should be the centers of debates about the greatest issues of the time. That requires a very active desire to be part of them. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's what we've tried to do at, at Columbia. Is that, am I responding to what you asked? Yeah, I, I was not trying something else, but I wanted to put, you, put it in the context of the university. Yeah, because I, yeah. I think uh, when you go to universities in, in some countries in this region, for example, we, we can see that some topics cannot be discussed. I, I'm an Indonesian specialist. Indonesia is now completely free. It's wonderful to see the university flourishing now where they weren't before. Yes. And it, it's really, uh, you can see the difference uh, in the quality of the basis. Era. So that, that's what I was getting yes, at. Right, Thank you so right. much. Thank you. Great. I think there's a lady over here, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Anne Valerie Olsen. I'm a researcher and scholar at IMG, which is a business school in Switzerland. I've recently moved here without my institution because I wanted to experience that mindset without the institution around it. I have a question for you, um, which is obviously in line with my business. What are you getting out of your partnerships? Because the way I see it, we have research centers across the world so that we can write case studies about other parts of the world, putting our frameworks into those case studies. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much, you know, it's going this way. The knowledge is going that way. And then we can show our students that we're doing really well with being global. but. I want you to give me a concrete example of what we're doing to actually integrate that knowledge we're getting. Yes, I understand. Thank you. So, um, so I, I think the, the point you made is exactly the point uh, I was trying to make in a certain sense. That is, there is a way of con conceiving of universities where what you say is we're, we're really, we've got enormous expertise. Uh, and we should confer that expertise on, on the world which lacks that expertise. Or it's really interesting to see the world. It's you know, got a lot of interesting things in it. Let's go do that and maybe we'll learn some things from it. Those attitudes are not wrong completely. They're just not, they're just not adequate to the situation we're in now where uh, as I put it in a recent uh, interview, for young people in the United States, as well as for old people like myself, knowing something about China uh, used to be a matter of, it's interesting. Now it's imperative that we know something. And because the future of the world depends upon, significantly on how China evolves and develops. And we can't afford um, any longer to, to see the world as just something of interest or a place you can go to do case studies. Uh, you, have to, you have to find out about it. Well, this means that we have, to, we have to provide opportunities for people to do basic learning because the, the degree of ignorance is so vast that this is, this is just not uh, a matter of, of, um, of just trying to you know, uh, learn a few new things. So the point of the centers uh, is to provide contexts in which people who are not necessarily experts can work with other people and local people on new problems that will help them experience the world in ways that they are naturally inclined to learn, that is through research, but not their expertise. I mean, that's an oversimplified way of saying it, but the point is a, the point is a sound, uh, I think the point is a sound one. 
So, um, so, so that's my my answer. I think the 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 point I would make about the uh, the alliance is that we need to provide not just student exchanges and not just faculty exchanges, but collective projects where we are working on real problems and therefore learning and, and contributing uh, to them. I, I think that would be a great next stage to this. Yes, please. Good evening, uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Pauline Tan. Uh, I would like to ask you what's the meaning of emirate, and then um, if a person have some knowledge about the life of herself, if a person were to write an autobiography of herself, can she earn a, a, maybe a title of PhD from your university? Is it possible through that kind of way to, like a thesis, uh, write a book and then earn a, um, a uh, uh, PhD or uh, master from your university without going to the university? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. No, the first question was that the em Emirates is referring to the United Arab Emirates, oh, Emirates in the Gulf region. That's where all the uh, universities are being set up, the branch campuses, yes. because UAE is very wealthy, so it can host campuses. Your yes. second question about whether or not you can earn a PhD by writing an autobiography, uh, I, the answer is probably no. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Okay, gentlemen over here, then over there, please, yeah. Hello, hi, I'm Sebastian. I'm from uh, Training Vision. It's a continuing education and training center. So um, the question basically is this. Um, all this while, uh, as you were talking, uh, President Bollinger, the, the whole aspect of um, research centers, you know, this, this was intriguing to me because we were talking about case studies, you know, we were talking about uh, linking with universities and getting the information across, which is fine. Uh, but where, does, where, where do industries, where do organizations come in? Because at the end of the day, it has to impact the marketplace. And we are learning about, or at least we are trying to understand globalization. And globaliz globalization is driven by the marketplace. So, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm sorry, but I couldn't see the link down there. Thanks. Well, um, in one sense, I, I'm rejecting, I think, the, the premise of the question. That is, I heard you ask, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I heard you ask, what does this all add up to for helping the marketplace? And my point is that I'm not against uh, free markets and, and capitalism. Indeed, I think they're uh, incredibly productive uh, in very beneficial ways. But there is a need, just as there is for any system by which we organize human activity, for a constant critique of that, for a constant review of it, for challenging it, for, I mean, the, the most recent financial collapse, uh, the, the, this recession that, that we have been in or still in, everybody now accepts that the failure of uh, global ways of dealing with this have to be corrected. Um, and yet we don't know how to do that exactly. Uh, but we understand that it's a globally interconnected economic financial in world. And we've got to develop some kinds of mechanisms to, uh, to control that. Otherwise, we'll be doomed to this cycle of, of deep uh, busts and, and some booms. Um, that's exactly the places where universities can make major contributions. That is by watching what's going on, by seeing what's, uh, where the problems might be, and by proposing uh, solutions. So. Um, so I, I think my, my idea is that we need to figure out ways in which we can catch up intellectually uh, with what's happening in, in the world and therefore help to channel it and control it and direct it and further it. And so it's, it's not against economic activity, uh, but I'm putting it sharply because I, I, I think there's too much of a tendency 
to think that globalization is just a great process and, and we ought to just, you know, let it go, let it flourish without being critiqued. Okay, first, uh, let me take, if you don't mind, the sure. lady in front, Natalia, then I'll come to you, okay? Yeah. I'm trying to get some ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hi, my name is Natalia Olenek. I'm a part-time MPA student as well as a journalist. Um, I'd like to um, touch on two statements you made regarding press freedom. One was uh, that it is a mistake to believe that the internet will end censorship. And the other is that a free and independent press can be created to serve the needs of a global society. I wonder if you could speak about that in the context of um, societies and regions with more limited press freedom, such as China, Singapore? <laughs> I, I, I would be happy to. Um, uh, I, so I, I, think, um, I think we have to start thinking in terms of how do we create a free and independent press for this much more interconnected integrated global society. I mean, that's the, that's the basic, simple proposition. Uh, when Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State Clinton, went to China in the last several months, she was strongly criticized for not raising, quote, human rights issues. Among those human rights issues would be free press, free speech, and so on. Uh, my view is that the, the very concept of human rights needs to be amended or changed. Because human rights, the concept involves a sort of thought that, a thought that, well, we've got, just take the United States, we've got our rights. And we want to make sure other people around the world also have the, the benefit of, of those rights, because we think it's only right, as people committed to human rights, that we promote these uh, for other peoples as well. My view is that's fine, but in today's more integrated world, it's, it's a much more practical kind of a problem. So, so Throughout the 20th century in the United States, uh, the United States went from a very local, local type of society to a national one. And part of that process was individual states and cities had to forego their own prerogatives about how to uh, censor speech or control speech and the like or press. And that was because you couldn't have a national conversation, a national discussion, if a local state like in New York Times versus Sullivan, Alabama, could have a libel judgment against the New York Times that would then stop the New York Times from being able to dis distribute this nationally because they'd start getting sued in individual states. Now we're facing that globally. So if you publish something in the United States, and it goes on the internet, it's now global. And if it violates censorship laws in other countries and you can be subject to prosecution, you may start to self-censor or you may be limited in your travel or the like. I mean, there's a wonderful recent case, wonderful in the sense that it's uh, revealing, uh, of a person named Rachel Ehrenfeld who published a book about Funding Terrorism, that was the name of the book. And a, it alleged in the book that a Saudi businessman was involved in funding terrorism. The book was published in the United States. It was on Amazon. And 20-some copies, I think, 23 copies, were ordered uh, in Britain uh, through Amazon. The Saudi business person, believing he'd been libeled, sued in British courts. The author did not show up. A judgment, because British libel laws are very, very favorable to the plaintiffs, a judgment was entered against the person for this statement. Now, um, she can't travel to Britain. 
There's a question whether that judgment can be enforced in the United States. Uh, representative, leaders of Google are under indictment in several places around the world because of things that are posted. I mean, this is now the world we are entering into, and we have to figure out on a world basis what is going to be the principle of free speech and free press. Uh, we're just entering that world. And my view is I like the system that has been developed of freedom of the press in the United States, and I want to try to argue for that on a global basis. Other people will have different views. We need a way in which to have that debate and conversation. I think we're just beginning that. So that's my uh, sort of nutshell version of the, of the point. Gentleman over there. <coughs> Good evening, uh, President. Bollinger, right. uh, this is a rather open question. I'm asking you for your thinking, your thought about this topic. Uh, it was good that you mentioned about the current uh, financial crisis because I was wondering whether I should be asking this question. Uh, current financial crisis situation, yeah. yeah. Okay. My name you, is Coach Chinhua. I work in a financial up. institution. Right. Uh, the current uh, financial world is dominated by an idea that originated from Chicago. Harry Markowitz, Eugene Farmer, uh, William Sharp on the idea of modern portfolio theory, efficient market. I'm a great admirer of Benjamin Graham of Columbia University. And Graham has a different definition of risk, a different idea of market. But it seems that after Harry Markowitz, the the whole idea of modern portfolio theory was globalized. Practically every university teaches it. Right? Whereas if you come to Ben Graham, probably with the exception of Columbia, and only probably recently uh, resurrected through the uh, Robert Halbin endowment, and one or two schools in, uh, in the US and everywhere else, Graham's idea was not actually taught in universities. Why was that so? Why, why is it that the, the Chicago idea became uh, so dominant that uh, practically every finance course teaches it? And I, yeah. you know, the, the whole Graham idea, which, which I teach in my institution, I, seems to have been uh, overshadowed completely. I just don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, but yeah, university course, presidents are not allowed to say that. You know? I know. You're I supposed know. to know the answers to all being questions. Modest, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I certainly know uh, Graham, and I know the, you know, the, I'm aware of the um, uh, investment uh, theory, and I uh, happen to know Warren Buffett because of service on the Washington Post board, and uh, I wish I were as wealthy as uh, I wish I'd followed uh, Graham in the way that he has, but, um, but I just don't know why it hasn't been taught on a wider scale. And so, within your school right now, I mean, is this a is there a, a major effort to uh, to resurrect this, to teach this? Well, I, I think it's taught actively. I mean, Bruce Greenwald is a very uh, distinguished member of the business school faculty, who's a leading expert on this. Uh, 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 on the Graham and Dodd work, and so I think it's still very much taught. Thank the you. struggle is not over. Lady over here. We have another five, ten minutes or so, so if you have questions, yeah, please. Yeah, hi. I'm Usha from the English Language Department in NUS. I'm a master's student. I think the idea that you said about us being learners again and being open to learning about the world in, in reaching out, I think is a beautiful thought. And my question is related to that. I wanted to ask, um, you know, in, in setting up these research centers and coming up with ideas and, and projects where people can bring in knowledge from these centers, which are, go out to South America, India, and, and China, and all these places, how much of these projects, how much of these ideas are going to come from ground up from these institutions? Or are these pro projects going to be proposed by the New York campus? How much of an interaction is going to be done with universities which already exist in countries which, where you are going to set up campuses? I mean, is there going to be a collaboration with universities in, in, in India and Mumbai? And, you know, right. uh, um, uh, it's, this is a related question as well. I mean, you spoke earlier about the lack of interest in 
social sciences as being one of the problems. I think this is a very um, serious issue from the country which I come from, which is India and Bangladesh and all these in the subcontinent especially. And a lot of research students who need to do research and field work in these countries actually come to other universities abroad in order to go back and do that work. I mean, these, this is a real problem, especially I think in the arts and social sciences faculties. I mean, are these going to be, um, are these centers also going to be open to ideas about developing social sciences related projects in these countries? Well, those are good questions. I, um, I, I mean, I, I think I want to say, first of all, what will happen to these centers will depend upon what people make of them. Uh, and uh, that remains to be seen. And what I tried to do today and uh, uh, under uh, conditions of severe jet lag, so I have no idea uh, mm -hmm. how, how coherent um, I was. Um, you, you have this weird feeling that somebody is speaking, um, and maybe <laughs> it's you, you know. Um, um, but I think that Hey, it's the, 7 o'clock in the morning yeah, in New York. You can wake up now. <laughs> um, um, the, the way in which this should evolve um, is that we should be going to the countries in the, where the regional centers are located, and we should be asking people there, what would, you, what would you like us to work on, and with whom? And uh, we're reasonably talented people. We've got some expertise, but that's not why we're here. We're not here because we're an expert on water. We may have a water expert on the team, but we, we are here because there are people from the journalism school and people from law and people from social work and undergraduates and graduate students. Mm -hmm. And we sort of want to devote a couple of years of our lives to seeing something uh, new and maybe some new research will come out of that. And ideas will, will emerge from those discussions and then uh, there will be serious work uh, done and we'll see what happens. Uh, my point, I'll come back to that. My point about social science research was that over the past quarter century, a lot of the social sciences moved away from thinking about specific problems or issues in the real world and, and uh, more towards uh, modeling and, and other kinds of theories. I, I think that's been very productive in lots of ways. Uh, my own view is uh, we need to probably find new ways in which to define the academic uh, agenda. I have a personal example that I give. So I was educated in the 1960s. That was a time when American society was being literally reshaped through the, the lens of American constitutional law. All the we talked about earlier about race in the United States, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, criminal justice system, um, what does democracy mean? All of these debates reshaped American society and they were done significantly in the context of American constitutional law. Lots of people went into American constitutional law like I did in order to participate in that and to develop principles and concepts and critiques and the like. That was tremendous. We changed our academic agenda in order to deal with the world to where it was. Um, that has passed. And yet we still have uh, a structure of academic uh, disciplines and research that is m more designed for that era than it is for this era. Uh, so if I were trying to think today about what to go into, if I were going into law, rather than freedom of speech and press, which I'm very glad I'm in and I still think it's very relevant, but I might choose international trade policy or I might choose dealing with energy and, and or I might choose uh, uh, how do legal institutions in developing countries evolve? What, what do we know about that? We actually know virtually nothing. Um, I mean, we don't study it. Um, so 
the, the hope is that in this era, there'll be more alignment with what are serious issues emerging from these kinds of little centers uh, and help to, to change. I recognize that what I'm talking about is a tiny, tiny institution in the scale of the world with a tinier little project. It's to reflect, but it does reflect a bigger view, I think, of what's going on. And, um, and, and it's that that I hope will, will happen. So the answer directly is, yes, it should, if they work well, deal with issues as they come from the places where they're linked, where they're based. And yes, I hope it changes the direction of social science and professional work. Um, for a man with jet lag, you did very well with that answer. <laughs> Now, for the last question, because it's already 7 o'clock, I'm going to give it to a law professor. Come on, you will have the last question. So we want, we want one law professor to challenge another one. Thank you, Kishore. <laughs> um, but unlike my colleague, I'm afraid I'm not an alumnus of Columbia Law School, although I had the pleasure of visiting the law school earlier this month as we have an exchange uh, agreement with them. Um, I, have, I have two questions. Um, the first one is... Um, could you please, when you go back, encourage the Columbia students to come to NUS for their exchange experience? Uh, and the second question... For their what? Just, what was the... To, uh, just, I was just kidding. Just ask the Columbia law students to come to NUS for their exchange experience. I think it will do them a lot of good. I think encourage um, the Columbia law students to come to our school. To, yeah. 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 But the second question, um, which relates to, to, to the theme of your, of your, of your talk today, um, I'm just wondering whether this is also an opportunity for us to rethink uh, the nature of universities. Um, when I was working in Australia many years ago, there was a report that was put out in the mid-1990s where uh, there was a comprehensive uh, review done of the universities because in Australia, as I think with many other parts of the world, there was a huge proliferation of universities and lots of technical schools and colleges became universities. And there was a great concern because the idea of university really is to address more of the higher order thinking, to push the frontiers of knowledge and so on. Um, and it's also very costly, it's a big investment. Uh, and so the report that was put up was very controversial because it, it raised questions, uh, such as I think something that you touched on, uh, whether professional schools, if what they mainly do is to train uh, students to be professionals, whether they should be part of a university. Uh, and so it was put to us, well, should a law school, for example, be a part of a university or should, or should it just be a trade school? Now, that was a very provocative question, but I think in light of what you're talking about, uh, it's something that we should think about. Um, should universities really uh, be focused on the higher order questions, on the kind of problems that, face, face, that we face today uh, in, in this global society? Um, and ask ourselves whether or not it's good enough that we just carry on doing the kinds of things that we, 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 we do. Uh, well. Right. I, I, think I, I think I understand. So I'm going to give it a shot from a couple of uh, angles. And I mean, I do. Do you, do you run a trade school or a law school? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm, a, I'm against trade schools. Um, I, I think um, I think it's important that we realize that, that universities uh, can change very substantially over uh, periods of over long periods of time, like several decades, um, and that we have major choices uh, to uh, to make along the way. So let me give an example of what a major choice might be for a school like this. Um, there are different ways to um, to engage in, in intellectual academic work. One is a law school where there are several dozen faculty and several hundred students and faculty try to cover the areas of expertise and, uh, and they write to work and they hopefully redefine their specialties as things change and, and uh, uh, that's what I'm advocating here and okay, that's great. Then there are medical schools. Medical schools have that. They also have hospitals. And they run, maybe they have affiliations, but maybe they also own. University of Michigan, where I was president, owned the hospital. 
uh, at Columbia were affiliated with the hospital. But these faculty are engaged in the practice of medicine and then do research uh, about it and, and, uh, and support some basic uh, research. And with heavy funding from the federal government, 500 to 600 million dollars a year is what Columbia receives uh, in NIH, uh, largely NIH research. Okay, law schools could, in theory, set up a very big law firm. They could have a thousand person law firm and the faculty could, could be part of that law firm. They could be the partners in the firm and also teaching and, and so on. Those are two different models. We know that academic medicine is very respected intellectually, and yet it has a very practical component. Law schools are very respected, but they don't. We just issued this past week, that is we, the journalism school under Nick Lemon, the dean, issued a report on how to save journalism in the United States with the decline in coverage of local uh, issues because the internet is undermining the financial model of the press. We know that. I'm very concerned about the decline in foreign coverage, international coverage, global coverage. They focused on local coverage, which is also declining. One of the recommendations of the report done by a faculty member and um, Len Downey, former editor of the Washington Post, one of the recommendations is that universities become more involved in producing the news. Journalism schools could run the New York Times. The, the Columbia Journalism School could have the New York Times as its teaching hospital, <laughs> uh, just like we have a very large hospital, a thousand bed hospital that operates on several billion dollars a year. Uh, and we could teach students, we could run. Okay, those are different kinds of models and over 50 years, universities could either move in the direction of much more engagement with the world, institutions like a law firm or a medical school or a, uh, you know, Columbia University buying the New York Times. Uh, the same could be true of public policy schools. I mean, we could have a major institution of experts who were dealing in trying to solve very practical problems funded by lots of different sources, some for profit, some not for profit, some, and you could have teaching uh, in the context of that. Uh, Maybe the global society needs uh, an, a, a sort of alliance of public policy schools that has a major practicing uh, kind of teaching hospital equivalent. I don't know what that would be exactly, but that's a, that's a, a possibility. I must say that's an excellent note on which to end the discussion because we, the schools of public policy, will just take over the government as a whole. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And run it as a teaching hospital. Right. <laughs> and then you get the best possible governance for yeah. Singapore and for the world. I like so that. So on that happy note, thank we you. thank you very much. It's Despite your jet lag, you came up with some brilliant ideas to save the world. Thanks, and I think you fulfilled the mission of Dr. Lee Seng. <laughs> thank you very much.